is the talk on data analysis uh, using PLPython. So we're going to be doing some data analysis within the database. Uh, I'm Keith Robertson. I work for Petra D, which is a small startup up in Colorado. Uh, we do data analytics and aggregation for oil and gas. So a lot of those examples will come from that domain, um, but definitely applicable across the board. So I'm going to start with uh, going into a little bit of data analysis in the database and why you might want to do that there. Um, I thought Jim Nasby gave a real good talk about that yesterday, uh, so we'll be building off some of that. <clears throat> I'll go into a uh, kind of a brief introduction to PLPython uh, and cover how you uh, work with that um, and what you can do there uh, and how you get those functions set up. And then I'm going to go into kind of a case study of what I did with it, which is some regression analysis. Uh, doing curve fits and uh, basing projections off of that. Um, so first start uh, talking about the, uh, the why here. Uh, first is performance, uh, particularly if you're dealing with larger data sets that can be distilled down into a smaller uh, result set when you're doing your analysis. Uh, results in less network traffic for one thing, uh, which, can sh which can be a significant performance gain to you if you don't have to transfer all your data out to an external application and do your analysis there if you can just operate on the data where it lives. Uh, potentially, you can uh, end up with less type conversion as a result of that. That uh, depends on your implementation there. Um, it can help you speed up your development process as well. And a lot of that comes from not having to move the data around as much. Uh, pretty substantial amount of code, uh, in my experience, deals with just moving data into the right place, massaging into the right format, getting it into, feeding into the interface that may be different for every single one of your different pieces of analysis. Uh, so putting that into the database can help you with that because you already have the data in that format. It's very consistent across the board. Um, those interfaces are fairly common. Uh, so that allows you to build some more robust uh, integration between your data and your analysis because those interfaces are consistent. Um, and that really helps you build analysis on top of analysis. So you'll do your first piece of analysis and then you will uh, feed that into a second piece. So for example, when I'm doing my regression analysis, I'm creating projections out and then I might do some economic modeling on top of what I uh, project out as uh, from my uh, production data, for example, in oil and gas. Uh, you can also go back into the database and select out data that depends on your analysis, uh, which is easier when you're already in the database. Uh, definitely simplifies that interaction between the different analyses because of that consistent interface. So uh, very easy to stack queries on top of each other. So you select out some data and then you feed the result of that data uh, into or that analysis back into the database, do some further analysis on it. And you get to do that without really losing anything. Uh, so when you're writing functions like PL Python functions, you're using fully fledged Python. Uh, you can bring in all those libraries that you would otherwise use in a normal Python. Uh, project, so you can use SciPy, you can use NumPy, you use Scikit-learn, any of those things are available to you within that function. So trivial case here, um, if you wanted to do something like you know, a large table and you want to select out all the values in that table that are greater than the average, you're not going to pull out all of that data into your application, compute the average in your application, and throw out all the data that isn't greater than that. You're going to do that analysis in the database, and you're going to pull out the data that you actually want into your application. Uh, so what I'm really saying here is you should extend that into some of your more advanced uh, pieces of analysis and do that same thing there. Um, so if you're trying to uh, do some financial modeling, you can do that in the database and you can apply these same principles where you're just trying to pull out who are my top 10 performers or something like that. If that's really what you're trying to get down to, you can do that in the database and you can do that fairly efficiently. So if you have pieces of analysis that are more advanced than what you natively get in Postgres, so obviously in that case you can select out the average very easily. That's something that's very easy to do in Postgres. But if you have something more advanced, um, you're doing some projection information, finances, uh, some do domain specific uh, piece of analysis that you need to run, you can build that in, you can extend Postgres. That's one of the beautiful things about Postgres is the extensibility. has stopped moving. Uh, one second. Let me try that again. There we go. So 
if you are uh, doing that analysis in the database, you can do it with a whole bunch of different languages. Uh, the official support is there for uh, PG SQL, uh, Tickle, Perl, and Python, but there's externally maintained projects for a whole bunch of different languages, including Java, PHP, R. A lot of data scientists are using uh, R for their analysis, and you can actually embed that analysis within Postgres, which is pretty cool. Um, these vary in their support and uh, their security, um, which I'll get into a little bit. but. What you, this allows you to do is instead of pulling out massive amounts of data into these applications, you can either write wrappers around your existing applications or you can write new applications in Postgres. And it really enables you to treat Postgres as that platform for that data instead of just a database that stores your data. So you're performing that analysis in Postgres still after you select out the data set. And while you're still in Postgres, then you can refine what data set you're trying to pull out. You can stack analysis on top of each other, and you don't have to export all that data to your application until you're really ready to do so, until you really have that final result that your application cares about. So your application doesn't have to be doing the legwork of manipulating the data, moving it around, and changing formats so that it matches different types of analysis. You can let Postgres do that, and it's very good at doing that. That's one of the core strengths of a database is massaging that data. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about PLPython and specifically um, try to go through some of the highlights and basic things that you should be aware of when you start writing PLPython functions so that you are ready to write your own at the end of this, hopefully, um, and you understand a few of the quirks that you can run into here and there. So like I've said, you can either take existing pieces of code that you have and write wrappers around it, and that's pretty easy to do. Um, doesn't take much code to do that at all. Or if you're doing new projects, you can implement them entirely in a uh, PLPython function. Um, but you have access to like importing modules. So you can very easily just import your existing code and write the wrapper around it. So first, to build it, um, you need to have Python installed. That's pretty straightforward. If you're building from source, uh, you need to configure it with PLPython or with Python and tell it where Python is. Uh, for this demo, I'm going to be using Python 3. Uh, and then you, in the database that you actually want to create these functions, you need to create the PLPython extension. And there is PLPython 3U and 2U, and then there's also PLPython U, which currently means PLPython 2. But the docs do say that, that could change if at some point in the far, far distant future, Python 3 actually becomes the standard instead of 2. Uh, so that U on the end of them means that they are untrusted languages. It means that within the function itself, there's no restrictions on what it can do. Uh, so that means that it can do things like delete files. So it can go and delete your database files if it had permission to do so, and that'd be pretty bad. So do you need to be careful about the functions that you create um, in, these, in this language? Uh, it's able to do pretty much anything as the database administrator. So you can connect to external services, um, you can manipulate files, you can do a lot of different things within these functions, and that's why it's an untrusted language. For that reason, only super users are able to create PLPython functions, um, and uh, services like RDS do not support PLPython for that reason as well. You are actually able to uh, use Python 2 and Python 3. You can use both of them, and you can use both of them in the same database but you can't use them in the same session. So you can't write a PL Python 2 function and a Python 3 function and use both within the same session because there are naming conflicts in the dynamic modules and you'll get some very strange results. Um, so the functions can exist, you just can't use them both in the same session. So the basic uh, syntax of a PL Python function uh, look very familiar to anybody that's ever created a function in Postgres. So you create function, you give it a name, you give it an argument list that's typed, and you give it a return type. And then in that function body there, you're just writing Python. It's just straight Python. Um, so whatever you need to do in there, you can do. That's where you would write your wrapper. Um, so as an example, we've got this function that is uh, pymax here. So take in two integers here, uh, returns the larger of the two integers. A lot of this information will look pretty uh, familiar to you if you've ever looked through the Python or the PL Python docs, because these examples come from that. Um, so if A is greater than B here, we're going to return A, otherwise we're going to return B, and then you specify the language. Uh, pretty basic. So in this example, 
we're going from select pi max 1, 2, we'll return 2. This is what the generated Python looks like, however. This is a little bit funky. Uh, so that number there is the OID. That's pretty standard. But what's a little unusual about this is that there are no arguments here. But we're still using A and B here. Now what they do in the implementation here, I'm not entirely sure how the internals work or why it is done this way. I'm sure there's reasons. But they're actually uh, defined as globals. Um, so that does some interesting things for you due to the way scoping works in Python. Uh, so if you uh, take this example here, where you've got this x equals x strip here, where x is a parameter, this will actually result in an error, because if you assign to x in a function in Python, it's going to treat x as local. So when it does the x dot strip, it's going to try to operate on the local version of x that is not yet defined, which is going to be very confusing. Um, it's going to give you an error. There are two different approaches to this. Uh, the recommended approach is to just treat your function arguments as read-only, if at all possible. If, for whatever reason, you just cannot do that, you can use the global statement. So you can just add the word global up here, global x, and that will tell uh, the function that whenever we refer to x, we mean the global version. So that's just a little peculiarity of uh, PL Python. Uh, so if you are, Question? yeah. It's global within that function call. So the call to um, pi strip in this case is going to, it's global within that scope. So the, the scope will get reset every time you call a new PL Python function. If you create another function, another function with the same session, yep. call it something else, and you've got also x text, that would be totally different. Yep. Okay. Um, so there's just some of the data types and the conversion. Um, so it converts the types for you. Uh, when you call the function, uh, it's pretty straightforward. The one thing that's a little um, can throw you for a loop here is that all the others get converted to a string. That includes things like JSON. So if you pass in JSON, it's going to come as a string, and you need to parse that in Python back into an object. Um, but otherwise, your bools become bools, ints are ints. Uh, so pretty much what you would expect otherwise. But for those data types that maybe aren't as you wouldn't consider as common, I guess. Um, probably going to come in as a string. You're going to have to deal with those yourself. You can also define your own types. You can also change that translation. Um, I think Jim talked about doing uh, NumPy arrays or matrices yesterday and defining that data type within uh, Postgres. When you're returning data, uh, it's similar, except all of your data is returned as a string to Postgres and then fed into the uh, uh, input function in Postgres. So you pass back an integer, it's going to pass it back as a string and feed it into the integer function in Postgres. Uh, Python none becomes null. Lists become arrays. Um, dicks become uh, composite types. Um, you can also return, if you're returning a composite type, you can also return it as a list, as long as the list is in the right order, um, that being the order that the composite type is defined in. And you can also return an object as long as it, it has a get attribute method in uh, there. If you're trying to return multiple rows, uh, you're going to either need to return one of these three things here. You're going to need to return a sequence that's a list or a tuple or one of those uh, list types. Uh, you're going to return an iterator, so an object that has the iter method. Or my favorite is to return a generator. Um, so that's a pretty elegant way of doing that in a lot of cases. This PLPy module is imported by default when you uh, have a PLPython function. And it has a lot of useful Postgres-specific things in it. So it allows you to access the database. It allows you to do some logging. Um, it has a few other things in there, but those are really the two I'm going to highlight. So if in your module you need to execute a query, you plpy execute, gives you access to that query. You get the return out of that. And you can access it as a uh, object. So pretty easy to do. Uh, that does cause some interesting uh, situations that you need to be aware of with transactions. So you're sort of in a transaction, but PL ex PLPy execute is going to execute your queries independently from one another. So in this example, we are taking $100 out of Joe's account and trying to add that $100 to Mary's account. But it is possible in this case for this first query to succeed where we take $100 from Joe and then the second query to not succeed. 
So Mary never receives her $100 and she gets really pissed off. Uh, to avoid that, you can put it in an explicit subtransaction here so that if the second query fails, it will roll back both. Um, but it is, you're not really in a transaction unless you do that. You will not have that behavior that you would expect. So if you are needing to log messages, this will put messages into the Postgres uh, log file. So you, it will obey your log settings as well. So if you have your log, so log settings set to warning, you throw a debug message, you're not going to see that. Um, it will actually throw exceptions if you have either an error or a fatal here. So those actually do throw exceptions. So now that we've gone through just some of the basics of PL Python and some of the strange things to be aware of there. I'm going to go through some basic regression analysis stuff and walk you through what I actually did in PL Python and the use case that was in mind there and how it can be extended to other use cases. Uh, so really when I say regression analysis, I'm talking about fitting curves. So I'm going to take data sets, try to fit curves to them, find optimal fits, um, looking at analyzing those trends and making projections off of those. So I'll take uh, well data or production data from oil wells in my case, and I'm trying to project out the long-term uh, production from those wells and do some economic modeling based off of that. Of course, the utility of this depends greatly on your data set, as XKCD is making point. Um, if your data is meaningless, then your regression analysis will also be meaningless. Uh, so this is kind of what the data set that we typically look at with this use case in mind looks like. So each one of these lines is production uh, from a single well over time. So on average, there's some consistency there, but an individual well can really be all over the place. Um, so this is all normalized back to a month zero, and there's about 20 months of history um, for this set. So that blue line there is showing the mean calculated at each month. Uh, so this is actually on a log scale too, so there is actually a pretty significant decline there. Uh, and so when you first turn on the well, it pumps out great, and then over time that declines as pressures decline and reservoir characteristics are changing. So you're trying to fit that decline characteristic so that you know what, uh, what you can expect out of the well at any given time. There's also a lot of variability in here, so you might be looking at this to try to understand uh, the variance in the system. and what happens when you have a well that doesn't produce very well versus what you can expect if you have a well that really hits it. So this is an example of some uh, curve fits and projections. Um, so these solid lines here are actually the percentiles calculated. Those are the, the real values. So at each month, the red line is the 90th percentile, uh, the green line is the 10th percentile, blue line is the mean, the yellow line is the uh, median. And those, these lines coming out here that are kind of faint are the actual projections. Um, so those are curve fits that were fit to these and projected out. Um, so you get an idea of the variance there. Um, if you have a punk well here, not doing so well, probably losing lots of money. If you have one of these up here, you're feeling pretty good. Um, that's really what, what our customers are looking for out of it. And that has a lot of uses as well. So from those projections, you can do a lot of financial modeling. You can look at the net present value of your well. Um, if you are trying to acquire a lease in an area, you can look at what you can expect based on wells that were put on production in the area surrounding it. Uh, if you're wanting to look at your cash flows um, over time, you can look at that as well. You can also try to calculate out your estimated ultimate recovery. So that is the total amount you expect the well to produce given a variety of different scenarios. And you can do that for reserve estimation. And you can also do some completion best practices. So what that means is you're looking at how good wells, um, how they've actually, why they are good wells, essentially. You're looking at what the operators did that made them good wells, how much frac fluid they pumped down the well, and that kind of thing. What did they do that resulted in this being a decent well? So when you're doing regression analysis, you start with a regression function. So this is the function that you're generally trying to fit. You're trying to optimize the constants in this to fit that well. Uh, in the example that I'm using here, the uh, most common equation that is used is called the ARPS equation, which is demonstrated here. So in this case, we're going to try to optimize Q naught, B, and D. 
and then the resulting curve should fit the data reasonably well. Um, but we also want to fit it in four different types. So we, we want to find a curve fit for the 90th percentile, the median, the 10th percentile, and also the mean. It gives you a pretty good idea of the variance in the system and provides different models for you depending on which case you manage to fall into. So for that mean, we're going to use uh, least squares fit to do the regression. Pretty common. Everybody does that. And then for the percentiles, we're going to use quantile regression uh, to essentially weight those lines so that they end up giving you a estimation of those quantiles. So least squares fit, you're just finding the minimum error, uh, the minimum of the square of the error. Uh, so that gives you a nice line through the mean of your data. Um, pretty easy to do. There's lots of functions out there to help you do that one. Uh, very common type of analysis. So this is how you do that in uh, Python. There's this function that is curve fit um, from the SciPy library. You give it that uh, function that you're trying, your regression function, which is f. You give it your x and y data. Um, optionally, you can give it a uh, estimate for your constant so that it starts off at some reasonable value and it takes it less time to converge. And it also finds the correct minimum since it's possible that you have several local minimum and you don't want it to find the wrong one and give you weird results. Uh, but most of those other arguments are optional and depending on your use case, may or may not need them. Either way, very easy function to use, gives you not back nice curve fits, fairly efficient, um, and you can write a wrapper around this in PL Python fairly easily and get access to this in Postgres. Quantile regression it looks more advanced, but it's really not. Um, pretty much when you're doing this, you are just weighting the errors. Uh, so in the case of doing a 90th percentile calculation, you're going to weight the errors of the points that are above the line by 0.9 and the points that are below the line by 0.1, resulting in it, the line shifting up to give you a 90th percentile line. Um, that's pretty straightforward, um, but it does take a little bit more work to get it to work with some of the Python stuff. So you pass in an objective function here, which is actually the minimization function. So you actually have to do the summing yourself is really all that means for this. It's a little bit lower level function, still pretty easy to use. Um, you give it that initial guess, pretty basic. Not very hard to write a wrap around either. So we're gonna take both of these functions, we're gonna put them in a PL Python function so that you can get mean regressions as well as quantile regressions out of it. Um, try to make that as flexible as possible. So the method that we're actually going to use to do the minimizations for the quantile regression is called Neldermead. Um, that is a um, simplex reduction uh, method. So you're going to take a n-dimensional simplex and try to reduce the volume to a minimum. Uh, so this method is perhaps not the most efficient method. It's definitely not the most efficient method, but it is incredibly flexible. So I can take any objective function and plug that into this with any number of variables and end up with a regression, um, or end up with an optimization at the end of the day from that regression function. So pretty easy to optimize all the variables in the regression function using this. Can use any equation, any number of variables. So perfect, that's exactly what I need. But now we also want to abstract it to any regression function, because we don't just want to be able to do ARPS. Um, even in oil and gas industry, we want to be able to customize that equation, and for any other industry, have a whole variety of other domain-specific equations that we want to be able to model. So need to be able to modify those equations for a variety of different reasons. Uh, there's definitely some domain knowledge that goes into those. Um, reservoir engineer maybe knows something specific about the reservoir characteristics that make them want to change one of the parameters and they know roughly what they want that set to and they don't want me to optimize it. You can do that. Um, certain special cases require special equations. So they may have uh, you know, a deep water well out in the Gulf of Mexico that is a totally different reservoir characteristics and doesn't follow an ARPS model particularly well. And they might have an equation that they think better models that. So we want them to be able to input that as well. If you're talking to like a financial analyst and they have totally different equations that model different systems um, depending on what they're looking at. So I want to be able to handle a lot of those different cases using the same system. So I want to be able to take that regression function and dynamically put it, build it in. So what this does is accepts the equation as a string, and then it will actually compile that into Python code and use that to optimize uh, as the optimization function. So for example, this is our same ARPS equation here, and that would be the string representation of it. 
everyone's kind of written equations that way. Uh, and then it actually built a math compiler. So I have a compiler in my plpython function that takes that string and will create the, PL, the Python function string. And then I'll exact that string. Function now exists, and I can use it for my minimization. This allows you to achieve, or in plpython, um, you're not limited to just what Postgres is able to do. Uh, you can apply parallelism to this. So just because up until Postgres 9.6 there hasn't been parallelism and queries have executed in one thread, doesn't mean that your functions can't. Your functions are able to create spawn off processes, do things in multiple threads. They can do all sorts of things that the language permits you to do, or the system permits you to do. So the curve fitting that I'm doing is pretty computationally expensive, and in general, I need to do four of them. So I'm generally looking at the 10th percentile, the 90th percentile, the median, and the mean. Um, so I just do all four of them in parallel. I have the CPU cores to spare, so why not? Uh, definitely helps quite a bit, and you can apply that to a variety of other situations. You can even do things like run things on the GPU. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in this. That just because you're in a database, you may not think of initially, but you can really do anything that you need to do uh, in this system. So this is an example of what my request might look like. I actually passed in my arguments as JSON, so I have a list of curves that I want to fit. So I have the equation in there, telling I want the 90th percentile, the 50th percentile, the 10th percentile, and then the last one's the mean. Uh, I get all those curve fits back. Uh, I'm, sending, I'm actually sending the data in as an array in this case. Uh, you could easily define something like this as an aggregate function and get back an aggregate, depending on exactly what uh, the output is expecting this to look like. I had kind of strange output requirements, so I ended up doing it this way. Uh, and then your output might look something like this. So this is actually uh, your x and y of the fit, um, and then some of the fit arguments that go into that. Those are the optimal parameters on the right there. So that, that really allows you to uh, do anything you want in there. So I now have a system that will fit a curve of, from any set of data with any regression function um, with any number of variables that need to be optimized. So that is applicable to a whole wide range of different industries that need to do any kind of regression analysis. And that wasn't that hard to do, as those functions were in Python. Um, and it was pretty easy to build those into the database. And now I can use those functions within the database. And so I get those projections out of the database, and now I'm ready to go do economic modeling on that. So I can then build the economic modeling into the database as well if I want. Or if I have some third-party software that's expecting my curve fits to be fed into it that will then do the economic modeling for me, I can feed those into that very easily. Um, so that allows you to have this consistent interface to your regression analysis that's doing your projections uh, that can be fed into a variety of other things in this consistent format that a lot of applications are expecting. So that would be the end of my talk. Um, want to just uh, so thank you for coming. Um, just wanted to highlight again that Postgres is a lot more than just a uh, database. You can really use it as the platform to run your data applications on and feed the results of your application of the plat data platform and that analysis into an actual application that then uses that data. So thank you. Any questions? Woohoo! Yep. When you mention the transaction gotcha. Yeah. If you have like an update statement, you mentioned the second update statement may not complete. But what about the hour? So I might have a transaction going on around the whole situation. Right. Right. It depends on whether or not you're catching the exception that gets thrown there, or if there is an exception that gets thrown on that. Um, I'm not entirely sure if it'll actually roll that back. It depends on how they actually implemented the PLPI execute. It might, I, since it's a sub-transaction, my impression is that the overall thing is still executing in a transaction, but it might not be true. I'm not positive on that. And yeah, go ahead.
that feels like another round trip to the database, but they're obviously in the database. Um, you know, I, it, is that? it depends on what you're comparing it to. So it is another round trip to the database, but you are already in the database. So if you're comparing it to an application that is going over a network and going for a round trip to the database, then yeah, it's a little bit different. But it still is going out to the database and selecting that out, and you're still facing some of that overhead of going to the database, yeah. It, it uses essentially the same mechanism that TLP GFCO uses, so I would expect uh, that the only real difference there would be the marshalling that's happening between the, uh, the Postgres internal data types into uh, Python objects. Um, so there's going to be a small amount of overhead doing that, but it, it should be essentially the same as just running the query. Right. FIT functions, will they accept an iterator? And have you looked at potentially doing that? Because then you don't have to build an array. True. That's, so you read the data, you copy it into an array, then you take the array, you copy it into PL Python. Yeah, no, that part is definitely inefficient. I'm not sure if there is an algorithm that would allow you to do that, because uh, most of these are iterative methods. So they're calculating the error sum over the entire data set each time they iterate, and they iterate a lot of times. So you would, maybe the first iteration, you'd have read all of it in any way. It's probably less efficient to have to read all that in from the database, you know, 10,000 times or whatever it's running anyway, so. I have noticed that uh, some things, I've seen some things in, in Python, and I think this is maybe specific to ND array, where um, you can mark the ND array as being read only. Yeah. That would potentially allow you have the ND array sit directly on top of the Postgres palette array memory. Um, I haven't uh, really taken a look at that for the, the ND array data types that I've created, but I, I, as far as I know, that should be possible. That would, yeah, that would be very interesting to take a look at because that could definitely have some performance improvements. So, yeah, I'll talk to you. That sounds interesting. Anything else? All right.